And today's reading will be from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native tongue? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in their own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Pastor Craig. Well, I want you to imagine if you were one of 500 special guests invited to Apple's next event where they're unveiling their new generation 15-inch MacBook Pro. Uh, you, 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 you go to the event, and as one of the honoured events, Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, personally hands you a box that says there is a brand new 15-inch MacBook Pro inside. Now you race home, you open the box, you look inside, but you're immediately thinking something's not quite right here. And you look again at the box, and it looks a bit cheap, and the spelling's a bit off, and the packaging's not quite right. And you open the box, and there is a computer, and it looks somewhat like a MacBook Pro, but the finish is poor. And you turn it on, you boot it up, and it works more like a PC from 1977 in a fake MacBook shell. Basically, it's a cheap knockoff that won't do the job. What would you think of Tim Cook, and what would you think of Apple? Probably not a lot. Now look, one of the great issues I have with what is declared to be miraculous gifts today, in particular the gifts we're going to look at this morning, healing in tongues, is that what is called these gifts today, I think are a poor imitation of what the true gifts in Scripture are. Now, the gifts called by these names in the churches of today, I want to suggest, and I want to work through this and show you, I think they're quite different to what we see in Scripture. And as such, I think they fail to declare the glories of God and His plan to save. So here is the point of this morning's message. Don't mistake tarnished imitations for the glorious reality. Don't mistake tarnished imitations for the glorious reality. The gifts that we read about in the Bible were unmistakably miraculous and I want to show you they portrayed, they were meant and designed to portray God's plan of salvation. And what we see today I think are unconvincing at best and crucially I don't think what we see depicts the gospel. Now it's important for us to remember everything God does has a purpose. There is nothing that happens in this entire universe that doesn't lead towards the fulfillment of his purposes, his plans. There isn't an atom, there isn't a molecule, there isn't an asteroid whose trajectory is not designed to facilitate God's plan for his creation. What is that plan? His plan is to redeem a people, a holy nation for his name. He's going to heal them and heal the creation from the curse, and then finally they will be gathered as one people, praising him in one tongue for all eternity. Now, it is not as if this plan is some secret plan. It's out there. And in fact, that is the plan that you and I are meant to proclaim every day and rejoice in every day. And everything the church does is designed around that to proclaim it. Many of the ceremonies, the rituals, the signs we have proclaim it. Baptism. It pictures the gospel, our entry as one people in a Christ's death and resurrection, 
The Lord's Supper pictures the gospel, our remembrance as one people of Christ's death and his covenant. Interestingly, some of the spiritual gifts, some of the miraculous sign gifts given to the early church were also designed to declare the plan of God to save a diverse people for his name. Now, it's been a little while, but we're working our way, slower than I wanted, but we're working our way through 1 Corinthians 12, and Paul's answering a question that the Corinthians asked him. The question went something like this. Paul, isn't it true that miraculous spiritual gifts were given to indicate who the more spiritual people are? Now, remember, Corinth is a divided church. It's divided on so many levels. We've seen they're divided over which leader do I follow. It's divided over rich and poor. It's divided over Jew and Gentile. It's divided over theology. And in fact, it's divided over the issue of gifts. Now, we've seen through 1 Corinthians, Paul's answer at every point is to give cross-centered wisdom for flawed saints. He consistently goes back to the cross and says, you find your unity, you find your answers, you find everything you need to know in the cross. Now, it's been a while, so earlier in this chapter, I remind you, this is what we saw about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are given to glorify Christ and to build his church. That is the purpose for them. The ultimate purpose for every gift is to glorify Christ and build up his body, his church. The gifts are meant to unify, not to divide. Now, we've been working our way, and this is actually the final one on the verses 8 to 10 of chapter 12, but we've been working our way through it, And just a reminder, we saw that these gifts are divided into prophetic revelation gifts, prophetic confirmation gifts, and prophetic sign gifts. This morning, I want to focus on the two gifts that are are most commonly claimed to still be available to the church today. What are those gifts? They're healing and tongues. Now, having said that, before we look at these gifts, I want to remind you of something. Spiritual gifts are a controversial area. Yeah, they are. But they are never meant to be a fellowship breaker. In fact, the very purpose for them was to unite, not to divide. So yeah, there are men and women who hold views about gifts that are clearly unbiblical. There are those who teach, you know, you can't get saved unless you speak in tongues. Or that uh, all of these gifts are for every Christian. Or give enough and God will heal you. And so I'm not talking about that end of the spectrum. That is a bad end. I'm talking about the end where there are many godly men and women who read the scriptures and they say, you know what, my understanding of the scriptures is these gifts are designed for the church and for believers in every age. And if that's what you hold, I want to remind you, you are a very welcome and important part of our church family. Our spiritual gifts are not something we divide over, uh, but I'll stress that in every area, what the Bible says is that each of us has to be Bereans, and we've got to decide what do we believe the Bible teaches. Now, I know what I believe in this area. You've been hearing it, you're going to hear it today. Um, you'll, you'll always know where I stand. But what I want to remind you is, just because you hear something from the pulpit doesn't mean that's what you personally have to believe to be part of the church. Uh, that's not the case. But you guys know me. There's a lot of things, and I'm pretty passionate about these. Uh, I'm a card-carrying, five-point Calvinist. That's who I am. We've got plenty of Arminians in our church, and we love them. They hold my limited, atoned feet to the fire, and I thank you for it. Um, I'm a complementarian. I'm a men-only-in-the-pulpit loyalist, but we've got egalitarians here, and that's great. Yes, you're not going to see a woman in the pulpit, but we respect your views. I'm more convinced today than ever of believers' baptism, but I'm going to fight for a paedobaptist right to hold their position. I hold to the distinctives of our church, and when I preach, you're always going to know where I stand, but I remind you the greatest thing we stand for as a church is that our unity is in Christ, not in any theological position. And that is the same in terms of spiritual gifts. Yeah, me, I'm a cessationist. I believe the miraculous gifts were given for a reason, the reason is done, but we have those people in our church who studied the word, come to a different conclusion, and I respect that. Uh, it's no hill to die on. So yeah, you're going to hear what I believe and why I believe it, but I urge each of you to be Bereans and study the scriptures for yourselves. 
And I bring that up because this morning we're moving to tongues and healing, which are two of the most controversial gifts. Are you going to hear my position? And hopefully you'll hear it loud and clear. But if you disagree, I've got no issue with that. But I will say, just don't expect healing in tongues to be part of our service anytime soon. So, why did God give those gifts to the early church? Here's what I believe. Healing in tongues were designed to authenticate true prophets and to picture God's plan of salvation. So they authenticate true prophets and they picture God's plan of salvation. Now, a couple of sermons back, I did a whole sermon on how those gifts, and in fact all these gifts, authenticate true prophets. So now I want to spend a bit of time looking at the other part of this. How do these two gifts picture God's plan of salvation? First, healing. What were the gifts of healing? Healing was a prophetic demonstration of God's plan to undo the curse and to heal the creation. Let me say it again. Healing was a prophetic demonstration of God's plan to undo the curse and heal the creation. Now, I'm going to spend much less time on healing because this one is pretty clear. Uh, A reminder. In Eden, no sickness, no death. The issue comes at the fall. The fall brings sickness and death in a God's good creation. But right at the beginning, God promises one's going to come who will crush the serpent's head and undo the curse. And then throughout the Old Testament, you see some prophets, not many, just some, who were given gifts to heal, sickness and even death. It wasn't a common gift, but it pointed to a great truth. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. One will come and he will bear our sicknesses, carry our pains, and we will be healed by his wounds. There is one who's coming who's going to undo the curse and the effects of the curse. We find that one coming as Jesus. Jesus comes, he heals, he heals the blind, he heals those who are paralyzed, he heals lepers, he even raises from the dead. And then people came and said, who are you? And he said, look at my signs. I do the signs of Messiah. I'm ushering in the year of the Lord's favor. He dies, he's pierced for us, he bears our curse. There is healing in the cross. But crucially, you know what? Those he healed got sick again. Those he raised from the dead, they died. There is still sickness and there is still death in this world. The point of those miracles is one day, all sickness, all death will be removed because of what Christ did at the cross. Now, as the church is formed, some of his prophets are also given the ability to heal, as a testimony that by faith you join Christ, and when the creation is healed, you'll be healed. Peter proclaims this, 1 Peter 2, 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. Ultimately, there is complete and total healing because of the cross. But that comes after the second coming. Revelation 21.4 He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain no more. Because the previous things have passed away. That's when it's done. In the new heavens, no sickness, no death. So the healings in Scripture were of incurable diseases and illnesses complete healing, instantaneous, undeniably miraculous. Healings that only God could do that pointed to the final healing only God can do. So what I want to say about this, not a lot. Uh, Does God still heal today? Absolutely. That's why we should pray and ask him to do that. But in my understanding, he doesn't give any person, any individual the gift to heal incurable diseases completely, instantaneously, in a way that is obviously clearly miraculous. Once the scriptures were written, once the church was established, we base our faith that God will heal in the the, uh, world to come, in the new heavens and new earth, not on those, but on the infallible word now. So the result is that in my understanding, what is called the gift of healing today bears no resemblance to the gift in Scripture. For example, if you read his book, Practicing the Power, 
Sam Storms argues along these lines. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul speaks of gifts, plural, of healing. And he says the plural indicates that different healers have different gifts. He says, so some are only able to heal migraines, some can only heal bad backs, and some can heal various kinds of maladies. He then says, we must also warn those that we practice the gift on that often the healing comes gradually, not suddenly, and may or may not happen. He says himself, of all the thousands he has prayed for for healing, the gifts actually only come on him twice. So I want to say, that's okay. That's just not what I read in Scripture about gifts of healing. Uh, partial and gradual healing of headaches, bad backs, for me, does not picture the healing of the creation in full that awaits the return of Jesus. Uh, look, that's his view. I respect him. And charismatic brothers have told me, yeah, but I have heard about genuine healings. Usually in some other country, frontier, missions kind of stuff, I've even heard of resurrections, but it's all anecdotal. And somehow nobody's ever there with a phone to capture it. Uh, it's not open to scrutiny. At best, it's incredibly rare, hard to track down. And I can tell you, years ago, I did try and track some of these down. And I want to say, you go to the healing tent up the road, uh, I think what you're going to see is a tarnished imitation of the real thing. Uh, I think the true gift was verifiable, clearly miraculous. There's no one going, how come they're not letting the really sick ones up front? How come she still limps? How come, uh, you know, that just seems to be a surge of adrenaline that wears off? Today's gift, in my opinion, you do your own study, doesn't match the scriptural picture. What about the gift of tongues? This is one I want to spend a bit more time on. Basically, tongues was a prophecy through a human language. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit. Tongues was a form of prophecy, and I'll show you that. The passage we read in Acts clearly says this is a prophecy. And I want to stress that it's an unlearned human language. The sign of tongues is used prophetically, and it uses the known human languages of the day. Now, before I talk about that, many, if not most, in the charismatic movement would say, I would take issue with that. Uh, they would argue, sure, sometimes tongues is prophetic, but very often it's not. It just edifies you in your relationship with the Lord. Um, they would always also argue, sure, sometimes tongues is a human language, but more often today it's an unknown angelic language. Now, I'm going to get into that a lot more when we get to chapter 14, but let me make a few comments today. If you remove the disputed reference at the end of Mark, New Testament tongues is only mentioned in two books, Acts, 1 Corinthians. Now, pretty much everybody agrees in Acts, tongues is prophetic and it involved known human languages. The debate is whether 1 Corinthians is talking about a different gift or the gift has changed or Paul's giving different nuances of the gift. I want to strongly argue the gift in 1 Corinthians is exactly the same as the gift in Acts. Now, much of the debate centers on one verse, so you can have a look at it there. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, uh, Paul says this, the person who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. The question is, is Paul saying that's a good thing or a bad thing? It's Paul saying, hey, you know what? In the time after Acts, the gift of tongues changed, and now it mainly builds up the individual. It edifies you. It's a different kind of gift. Or is Paul condemning and saying, what are you doing? You're doing something that builds you up, not the church, and that's wrong. We'll look at this more, but when you look at the context, especially the next two verses, I think Paul's condemning this practice. Look at what he says. The person who prophesies is greater than the person who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so the church may be built up. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you with a revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? He's saying, no, no, no. It's the church that needs to be built up. Tongues was never meant to edify an individual. Some Corinthians just prayed to God, building themselves up. Nobody benefited. Paul, I believe, and we'll look at this more, is saying, this is wrong. I think he's condemning it. The other issue is, well, is the true gift of tongues, can it ever be an unknown prayer language, an angelic kind of language rather than a human language? Uh, the proof that is cited is 1 Corinthians 13.1. 1. 
Paul says, if I speak in human or angelic tongues but don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And they would argue, there it is, black and white angelic languages. Look, the, the issue is, this verse is in the subjunctive. It means, if I spoke in tongues or if I even spoke in angelic tongues, what's the subjunctive? It's like me saying, look, you know what? Even if I was six foot six, I couldn't dunk a basketball. The point is not to say I'm six foot six. The point is to say I can't dunk a basketball. Paul's not saying there's angelic tongues. When you read this chapter, his point is even if there were such a gift, what you really want is the greater gift, which is love. So why even mention angelic tongues? We've talked about this, but some in Corinth, considered themselves to be already angelic. They were already like the angels. That's why they were so spiritual. Uh, we saw in chapter 7, I'm so angelic, so spiritual, I don't need sex today. And in chapter 15, we're going to see, I'm so angelic, I don't need a body in the future. Here they're saying, and what shows that I'm so angelic is that I have this gift. Context here says Paul's not agreeing with them. He's saying, look, even if you did have this gift, that's not the point. If you don't have love, you are nothing. You're not spiritual. Look, I don't believe there is a gift of angelic tongues. I believe that was a Corinthian fantasy. The other reason that this is often brought up, non-human languages, comes from a misunderstanding of the King James. The King James translators, in many places, they decided to help us out, and they added words in to help us out. Now, they at least put them in italics, but in chapter 14, they added a word, unknown. For example, 1 Corinthians 14, 4, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifies the church. What they meant and wanted us to understand is by an unknown tongue was a tongue that was unknown to the speaker. He didn't learn it. Be like me suddenly praising God in Hungarian, a language totally unknown to me. But many charismatics read and said, Ah, Unknown language, that means unknown anywhere in the world must be angelic. Fortunately, all the modern translations don't help us and don't put the word in, but it's there. So an angelic language, I also want to suggest, runs contrary to everything we know about this gift. We're going to look at this in Acts. Let's make it a very different gift to what we find in Acts. Yet despite all of this, Today, 99% plus of those who claim the gift say, I got the angelic version. Uh, the true gift of tongues in Acts, it was clearly miraculous, it caused astonishment, it caused amazement. Today, I've got to tell you, none of that angelic stuff causes astonishment or amazement. It is not a miraculous human language unknown to the speaker. It's something almost anyone can produce. And you know what? Pretty much everybody does. Uh, this gift is not just claimed by evangelical Christians. It's found in pretty much every cult. It's in the Catholic Church, it's in Islam, it's in Buddhism, it's in Hindu, it's in paganism, it's in Satanism. Some form of unknown ecstatic language, it's found everywhere across this earth. And then all of them say, this shows I have a genuine, true connection with the supernatural. I think Part of the issue for Paul, in the first century, it was well known that pagans spoke an ecstatic speech. It was well known to exist in Corinth before Christianity arrived. And I want to suggest that what's going on was very different to the true gift, the one that was outlined in Acts. Now, having said that, many, many charismatics have told me, yeah, but you know what, I have heard reports about a known human language, it still occurs, usually in mission settings. They'll all tell, I'll ask them, but do you know I got the angelic kind, but I know the axe kind is still here somewhere. They've all met somebody who heard somebody who heard somebody. And I'd say, look, considering there's literally tens of millions speaking in tongues daily, where are these miraculous ones? Surely someone's caught it on video, everyone's got a phone. Where are those who have this language, they praise God, they never learn that others understand? Elusive sign gifts, I don't think that was ever the point of sign gifts. So, that brings us to ask, well, what was the purpose of tongues? Now, I'm sure you've heard many things suggested. 
Some said it's a translation tool. And that's why it happens out there on frontier missions. Many say, no, today the main use of tongues is as a prayer language that edifies yourself, it builds up your faith as you pray to God. I just don't find these as reasons given in Scripture. And I want to suggest Scripture's pretty clear about the reason for the purpose of this gift. Paul puts it out there and it's pretty clear. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 22. It's written in the law, I will speak to this people by people of other tongues and by the lips of foreigners, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Speaking in tongues then is intended as a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is not for unbelievers but for believers. Tongues is a sign to unbelievers, and specifically in the context it's unbelieving Israel. So here's how I want to sum this up. Tongues was a prophecy through a human language as a sign to unbelieving Israel of God's plan to undo the curse and create one nation from all peoples. Tongues was a prophecy through a human language as a sign to unbelieving Israel, God's plan to undo the curse and create one nation from all peoples. Now, that's just a huge, big information dump, so I've got to unpack that. To understand what Paul is saying in those verses about the purpose for tongues, we've got to do a little biblical theology. We've got to look at what does the Bible say about tongues. Now, remember, tongues is just the Greek word for languages. So, let's go all the way back to the garden. In Eden, guess what? One nation, one tongue. God creates Adam and Eve. There's one family who are one nation, and they all speak one tongue. Then comes the fall. Messes everything up. Sin led to illness, marital discord, fractured families, death. In the chapters after the fall, we see this one family spreading out across the earth, But then we see the flood, the earth's reduced again to one family, one nation, still speaking one tongue, but then Noah's descendants begin to spread out. Then comes a very significant event, Babel. Have a look with me at Genesis 11, 1 to 8. Genesis 11, 1 to 8, or you can just listen. Here's what happened at Babel. The whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. People migrated and they said, come, let's build a city, tower with its top in the sky, let's make a name for ourselves, otherwise we'll be scattered throughout the earth. Then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower the humans were building. The Lord said, if they've begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down there, confuse their language, they'll not understand one another's speech. So from there the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. So after Babel, what have we got? We have many nations, many tongues. Significantly, the very next thing that happens after Babel, you remember what happened? The call of Abraham. Now listen to the call of Abraham. Genesis 12, 2. God says, Abraham, and back then he's just Abram, I will make you into a great nation, I'll bless you, I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I'm calling you, Abram. And from you, I'm going to call one nation which will become great. However, don't think my plan is just to call one nation. Because you've got to read verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All the peoples of the earth. All those disobedient nations with their own language, the plan is that ultimately they will be blessed through the seed who comes from you. Now, if you want to unpack all this theology, read Romans 11. Paul unpacks it there. He talks about God's plan to regraft all the nations back into the root. Now, from this point, in the Old Testament, God calls Israel, he gives them the law, But in case they miss what their purpose is, you get a number of verses like this. Isaiah 42, 6, where we're told, Israel, do not forget your task. You are to be a light to the nations, a light to the Gentiles. Living as the people of God, that was supposed to be such that the nations around would see and go, that's how the people of God live. 
That's who I want to be. Unfortunately, Israel disobeyed. Instead of being a light to the nations, they became just like the nations. And so when you read the Old Testament, God sends a prophetic sign to the nation. What is it? It's tongues. Listen to these verses. Uh, Deuteronomy 28. God outlines all the blessings if they obey and keep the covenant, but then there are cursings if they disobey and if they live like the nations. Deuteronomy 28, 49. The Lord will bring a nation from far away, from the ends of the earth, to swoop down on you like an eagle, a nation whose language, whose tongue, you don't understand. One of these nations that you're supposed to be a light to, because you have become like them, when you hear this tongue that you don't understand, it'll be a sign that judgment's there. And that's what happened. Isaiah 28, 11, For he will speak to this people with stammering tongue and in a foreign language. That's the passage Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 14. Jeremiah 5, 15, I'm about to bring a nation from far away against you, house of Israel, a nation whose language, whose tongue you don't know and whose speech you don't understand. So unintelligible tongues hearing foreign languages that they couldn't understand, became the sign that Israel had failed, that they'd gone off track, but God hadn't. You see, the true Israel will succeed where Israel failed. In the fullness of time, Jesus comes into the world. He lives, dies, rises from the dead. Now, the book of Acts opens with Jesus addressing his disciples just before he leaves this world. And what does he say? Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Saying, hey guys, I'm going. Remember what I taught you. The message of salvation is not just for Israel. It's meant to go to the nations. You guys are supposed to go to the hated Samarians and the despised Gentiles. Now, I came to implement God's plan, but I'm going... I'm leaving it with you. Now, that shouldn't have come as a shock. They should have known this. You know it from Abram. You know it from Israel. God made it clear. And in his ministry, what did Jesus do? He preaches to Samaritans. He preaches to Gentiles. Remember after he healed the Gentile centurion's servant, Jesus said this, Truly, I tell you, I haven't found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west, to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 8. Many are coming to be part of this people. John 10, 16. I have other sheep who are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. There will be one flock with one shepherd. Hey, I've got other sheep out there, the Gentiles. They've got to come and be part of this flock. The plan was always one people from many nations. So it should be no surprise his last message and words to them are, don't forget, go to the nations, guys. Go to the nations. But we know from Acts, the disciples, the apostles, they struggle with this. They really struggle with the idea, really? I don't want to be the one to go to the Gentiles. All they heard was, Abram, I'm making you a great nation. They didn't want to hear, in him, all the nations will be blessed. So, not only did they have the words of Jesus, but right after that, God gives them a sign. And what was it? It was tongues. The languages of the nations, the languages of all these Gentile nations, would be a sign to remind them the gospel's supposed to go to the Gentiles. Have a look at the passage that was read in Pentecost. Acts 2, 1 to 5. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. So there's Jews and there's converts to Judaism from every nation speaking all these languages and they hear the apostles and the others proclaiming the magnificent acts of God in their language. Everyone's wondering, what's going on? What does this mean? 
So Peter stands up and says, hey, no one should be surprised by this. What you are hearing is the fulfilment of the prophecy Joel gave. A day will come, he says, when men and women will prophesy. This speaking in tongues, it's a prophecy, it's a prophetic sign. And, he says, and if you're confused about what it means, look at it, Acts 2 verse 21. What does it mean? Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Prophesying in tongues was a sign to the church that it would be built from every nation, that everyone from every nation who calls on the name of the Lord will become part of the people of God. Now notice as well, this time the Jews understood the languages. They heard the praise of God and their language is a sign that all nations are to be a part of the people of God. So, let me summarise. Acts begins with Jesus saying, go to the nations. Acts begins with the sign that they're supposed to go to the nations. So, what did they do? What did they do? Not much. The disciples did not get together and say, okay guys, someone's got to go to the Gentiles. Could I have volunteers? Andrew, I see that hand. John, I see that hand. You're going to the Samaritans. Somebody's got to go to the Gentiles. Yep, Peter, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, thank you for your service. Get going. That's not what happened. The prejudice was too strong. So they stayed in their little holy huddle in Jerusalem. And so a couple of years later, God sends persecution to drive them out. And God forces them out into Judea and Samaria. So in Acts 8, Philip is in Samaria and he preaches the gospel and some Samaritans believe and they are baptised. Incredibly, when word gets back to the apostles, they go, I don't think so. They're Samaritans. So they send Peter and John to check out, man, what's going on? So they go down there and they talk to them. They go, yep, they are believers. And then the Holy Spirit falls on them, most likely signified by them speaking in tongues. It's a sign to these unbelieving Jews the gospel has indeed come to Samaria. Then in Acts 10, remember what's going on? Peter's up there and he's having a little snooze and this vision comes, clean and unclean animals. Now, it's not as if Peter sees this and goes, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to go to the unclean ones, the Gentiles. Three times he goes, I don't get it. I, I, I don't get it. And God says, Peter, don't you call impure what I have called pure. And Peter goes, I don't get it. And finally, some men arrive from Cornelius, a Gentile, saying, are you Peter? Yep. An angel sent us. Oh, okay. Peter goes, and he comes to Cornelius, and this is what he says, Acts 10, 28. You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner, but God showed me I must not call any person impure or unclean. Look, I really didn't want to come. You guys are impure, but God said go, so here I am. And reluctantly, Peter accepts the truth. Acts 10, 34 to 43. Now I understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, and now he's commanded us to preach that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Even you guys can have your sins forgiven. And to confirm this, as he's speaking, the Spirit comes on these Gentiles as they believe, and the Jews hear them speaking in tongues, declaring the greatness of God. However, you know what happens after that. Word gets back to the guys back in Jerusalem. And so when Peter gets there, he's challenged again, what were you doing going to these uncircumcised dogs? How could you do that? So here's what Peter says, Acts 11, 17 and 18. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus, how could I possibly hinder God? When they heard this, they became silent. They glorified God saying, okay, God's given repentance resulting in life even to the Gentiles. Now Peter says, I I had reservations too, but man, you know, three times the vision of the unclean animals, the guys turning up saying an angel sent me, and then the gift of tongues... We've got to accept it, guys. Gentiles are in the kingdom. Tongues were a sign to unbelieving Jews of God's plan to create one nation. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 sums up the plan. 
But you, the nations who lived in ignorance and the empty way of your ancestors, now you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you weren't part, but by faith you are now part of this one holy nation. Now, we might still speak different languages, but we're one holy nation. Now, the plan still isn't finished. One day, Jesus will return. The curse will be destroyed, and every effect of the fall will vanish. And finally, finally, we will be one nation with one tongue in the new heavens. Listen to Revelation 5, 9 and 10. And they sang a new song. Because you were slaughtered, you purchased for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you made them into one kingdom. They're priests to our God, and they're going to reign on the earth. The blood of Christ took people from every tribe and people and tongue and nation and made them one, one people, one nation, one kingdom. More than that, verses 11 to 13. Then I looked, then their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands, and they said in a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on sea, everything in them say, blessing and honour and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. All these people as one people with one tongue praising God. That's the plan. So you put it all together. Tongues was a prophecy through a human language as a sign to unbelieving Israel, God's plan to undo the curse and create one nation from all peoples. So now we can think a little bit more about what's going on in 1 Corinthians. Throughout 1 Corinthians, Paul's made it very clear. The gospel unites. It takes men and women, slaves and free, rich and poor, and even Jew and Gentile, and makes them one. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many parts, so also is Christ. For we are baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. This church was so divided. Divided over their leaders, over their theology, over rich and poor. Their misunderstandings widened their divisions. A few sermons back, we looked at the Lord's table. Here is this thing that they're supposed to do that is a symbol of their unity and it became a way to celebrate their disunity. The rich and poor celebrated it differently. And now we come to this gift, tongues, that is designed to declare the unity of the people, that Jew and Gentile are one. In fact, all people are one in Christ. And in Corinth, it becomes a source of division. I am more spiritual than you because i got the angelic gift and you don't. And Paul turns up and says, I'm having none of it, guys. Now, clearly some in the church had the genuine gift and we're going to look at that. It's the same as the gift in Acts. But others seem to have this imitation version, the one that didn't line up with the description in Acts and the purpose in Scripture. And in fact, it seems that they were saying, our angelic kind of tongues is the highest gift, it's higher than the human tongue kind. And Paul says, nah, <clears throat> what you're doing is what the pagans do, ecstatic babbling. Don't call it tongues. It's not a gift of a known language and it's not a sign that all the nations are one in Christ. It doesn't edify the church. It doesn't glorify Christ. Now look, I don't mean this to offend anyone, but my issue is that what is often called the gift of tongues today seems much more like what Paul was warning the Corinthians about. Today what we see is usually an unknown angelic language, nothing clearly miraculous, nothing different to what's happening in other religions, often used to edify the individual, often uninterpreted, and you can judge for yourselves whether that gift has united more churches or divided more churches. It seems very different to the gift in Scripture. Now perhaps we can pause for a minute and imagine what those gifts would have been like in the early years of the church. Healing was never a divine panadol. Prophets were healing the blind, the lame, even the dead. 
as a declaration that in the cross of Jesus, the creation would be fully healed of sin and every consequence for all eternity. Tongues in those days was not something that just made an individual feel a bit closer to God. Men and women were declaring the praises of God in a language they never learned as a pronouncement that Jesus has come to take all the nations and make them one in him, praising God with one tongue forever. They were clearly miraculous. They were verifiable. They pictured the gospel. I personally do not see how intermittent partial healing of minor illnesses glorifies Christ and proclaims the gospel. I don't see how a private prayer language that others can't understand glorifies Christ and declares the plan of the kingdom. That's my opinion, and I know it's only my opinion. It's how I understand these texts. But having said that, I know there are godly men and women who read these very differently, and so I don't want this to be divisive. So if you or somebody you know speaks in tongues as a private language, and it does edify you, it draws you closer to God, it helps you worship Him, it's for you to judge the truth and relevance of what you're doing. If it's something precious to you and you're convinced it does edify and glorify Christ, I acknowledge that's the way you genuinely understand the Scriptures, and that's fine. So we'll say this. Could God manifest those gifts in their full glory today? Of course He could. Does He? Personally, I don't believe so. I believe that they serve their purpose, and now we wait for the full outworking a people healed of sin and its consequences, united as one, praising God in redeemed bodies forever. When I read about the real thing and consider what they point to, I tell you, I do find it really hard to get excited about the watered-down versions. But perhaps the way forward is for us to realise it doesn't matter where you stand on this, don't focus on the gift, don't focus on whether they're here in some form or not, Focus on what we all agree on. In some way or another, they are to glorify Christ, build his church, they point to the plan. And we should focus on the time when they're completely fulfilled. The time when Jesus returns, the curse is done, he builds his kingdom, and he's going to build it from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. He'll heal our bodies forever and unite us as one in the new heavens, as one people, praising him with one voice for all time. That's the good news. And if we get rid of all the other stuff and make sure we proclaim that, we're doing okay. It's something every one of us can celebrate. Why don't we pray together? Father, these are hard pastures, hard verses, but despite some of the the noise that goes on in them, help us to see the true glory, which is Christ, that he came into this world to undo the fall the curse, the effects of the fall, that he has a plan to build a people from every tribe and tongue and nation and that one day they will praise him forever with one tongue, that their bodies will be healed of sin and the consequences of sin, that our bodies will never wear out again and we will never die. Lord, that is what they all point to. That is our gospel, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, anyone who believes, Anyone who trusts in Christ because of the cross will be healed, will be part of the kingdom. Help us to remember that. Help us to proclaim that. Help us to find our unity in Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen.